As they do, I remind you of our, our new giving system that we have. You can see it on the screen. Uh, many of you are, are you ask about the different giving options. If you want to pull out your phone, you can give via your phone. You can do that by uh, texting that number, 77977. And then you text in the word GW Shreve, and it'll send you a link. And you can give online. You can set that up. The beautiful thing about that is Pastor Donnelly has been telling you week after week, you can click the little button and set up the recurring gift. So it comes out, uh, you know, on the 1st or the 15th. You can set it up biweekly. You can set it up monthly. And then it just, it, it, it just automatically uh, happens, and you won't forget it. Because it's, it's amazing how many people have told me, you know, Pastor Dusty, I forget. I, I don't, you know, I don't use checks anymore. And then I, I forgot to go by the bank and get cash. You, you, you know how it goes. And they've had, do you have something from a debit card? They've asked those things. So this is a system and you got your phone, you can do that way. And so we encourage you uh, to get involved that way. One of the things that I want to say about, um, uh, just because I know how the devil is a good, good uh, framer when it comes to uh, ways of thinking ideologies and mindsets. You may be thinking, well, why do I need to give to the church? They got $60,000 in the bank, right? See, if we start with that thought, we've started with the wrong thought, right? We don't know what tomorrow holds. You may remember that earlier this year, we had every air conditioner in this sanctuary go out. And you know, those $28,000 a pop air conditioners aren't very cheap. Thank God we had money set aside that we could do that so that we finish the year this year in the black and not in the red, right? So we're believing God for that. We believe God that he gives us wisdom to steward it, but that we're obedient, right, and do what God's called us to do. Amen? So, hey, you may have a need this morning. We want to believe God with you. If you have a need, we just ask you to stand up and just signify you're just saying in faith. God, you see me standing, and then I want you to pray with me as we pray over your needs this morning. We'll pray over our giving. Remember, I want you to see you're living as living before the Lord, living under the Lord. So when you give, serve, whatever you do, you do it as unto the Lord. Jesus, this morning, many in this sanctuary have stood, believing you to meet the needs that they've stood for. God, I'm already standing, but you know I'm standing in for people and my family. God, there's other needs that I'm standing for, believing you to do above and beyond whatever I could even think. God, do that in the lives of your people. Bless them. Help them to grow. Lord, work out things in their families. God, in relationships, God, reconcile and rebuild and restore, redeem what seems to be unredeemable, Jesus. God, I ask you to continue to have your hand upon Gateway Church and the people here. God, may you bless them and enable them to continue to give and be faithful in that. God, help them to take that step of faith for those that have not taken that step of faith. In Jesus, this morning, we give all these things to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, as they're coming around, I got one more announcement for you. You know, Chantal and I were talking about this, and we said, you know, we, uh, we set up our Christmas tree and started decorating the house this weekend, and uh, we do it unashamed. We know we're not ashamed about that. You know what I think about? And hear me, you may hear my reasoning on this, and you may just go home and decorate today, right? I'll tell you what, when I start thinking about the Christ of Christmas, it sets up my Thanksgiving. Come on. You hear, you, you, when I start thinking about the Christ of Christmas and all he's done for me, you know what it does? It makes me thankful. It sets my attitude, my mindset right. You know, this is too short of a season. Christmas should be about three months at least. You know what I'm saying? Just, just to celebrate, you know what I mean? Christmas should be all year, but I'm just saying Christmas needs to, at least we need to extend this. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's good. People are kind. People are nicer, right? We, we like to do and give and serve. So it's, it's okay to do that. But hey, one of the things that we do around here at Gateway Church, we do a thing called 12 Days of Christmas. Anybody remember 12 Days of Christmas? Right? So from that last Sunday, right before Christmas, we start 12 days out, and we start doing not random acts of kindness, strategic acts of kindness. I believe that we should be strategic in what we do. God, give you, God gave you a mind, right? Use your mind to be strategic in doing good. The Bible says you should do good all the time and all the ways you can to all the people you can for as long as you can, right? So it's good to do good to others. And so 12 Days of Christmas is something important around here. If you have not signed up to be a part of the team that lays this all out for us, grab a little Connect card. I know you want, lots of you want to be involved in this. You just haven't signed up. Get a Connect card. Nobody even grabbed a Connect card. Okay, Lord Jesus, I pray you'll touch their hearts today, right? Fill out a Connect card. There's a little giving boxes back there at the back. You can slide it right in that giving box, and then we'll get that, and we'll contact you as we build this team to see that this church makes an impact in the community this Christmas. Amen? 
Has Jesus not been doing all kinds of good stuff for you all year? Right, so we could take at least 12 days to be strategic and doing some good outside of the church, right? Oh, come on, come on, you know what I'm saying. All right, let's see. We are going to finish up our series on honor today. Uh, let me welcome the online guest. If you're with us this morning, thank you for taking time to be with us. We like to do this. If you got your phone, take it out and go to our Gateway Church Shreveport. That's our uh, official business Facebook page where you can share the live stream. When you share that live stream, it gets out to all your friends and family, and they'll hear the message that you heard this morning. They'll get to see all the things that you're getting to see as well. Amen? Oh, let me also say this. The, the Facebook group where you can connect is Sharing Life at Gateway. So when you put that in the little search, Sharing Life at Gateway, and then just ask to join that group. Try, trust me, you want to be a part of that group because we give a lot of information out that way. So again, online audience, thank you for being with us today. So today's message is on honor, but we're going to title it A Life of Honor. So you can get your Bible out, and we're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel. And what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to pick some verses out of the book of Samuel, and I'm going to give you these little snippets to give you a little picture of what David's life was like leading up to his time of being a king. Now, I, I'm a little nervous about starting this message, all right? So I've been debating on this all week, and actually it, I've been wrestling with it this morning. I've had anxiety over this, and so I, I just I haven't started a message like this, and so I, I don't want anybody to get upset with me. My wife doesn't even know what I'm about to say, so you, just you know, I don't want anybody to get uptight or walk out after I say what I'm about to say, okay? So everybody with me? We're all going to... Be, you're, we're going to handle this okay, right? I just said all that to get your attention. <laughs> I wanted to make sure you all were paying attention. No, just, I am just kidding. We only have eight Sundays left in this year. That's it. Eight Sundays left in 2018. I know I let you down right there, but I got your attention. <laughs> But you know what that means. Eight Sundays left and it's 2019. You know what that means, right? New Year's resolutions, right? New Year's resolutions are about to happen within the next few weeks, right? You're going to start going back to the gym, right? You're going uh, to lose 10 pounds in 2019, right? Some of you, you're going to start doing some things that you haven't been doing. You're going to quit smoking this year. You're going to stop eating out as much as you've been eating. You're going to read and start write, working. You're going to write a book, right? Some of you are going to do that. You're going to start it this year, right? You're going to get your family back in church on a consistent basis, right? I'm going to start reading. You got all these lists of New Year's resolutions, right? That's what we're going to do. But what we do is we kind of set our commitment level. See, we're all together. See how we're, we're, we, we did that this morning? Everybody's paying attention. We set our commitment level on intermittent. Come on, you know what I mean when I say intermittent, right? You know, you, you know, on the side of your car, you got that little lever there. It works for a turn signal. You can use it for a turn signal. That's okay sometimes too. But you set it on intermittent when it's not really raining that much. And so you don't, it's just not steady, continuous. It's off and on. But that's the problem with our New Year's resolutions. We set our commitment level on intermittent instead of continuous. And when I talk about a, a life of honor this morning, we've got to set our commitment level on continuous. See, Christianity is not something that we set on intermittent. It's not just when I come to church today, I'm going to turn on my Christianity level, put on my Sunday smile, right? So we, we set it on this continuous setting. Now, I can remember about three years ago uh, when Ron asked me to start working out with him, and he and I started working out during the week. And so we work out four days a week. Before that, Dusty's commitment level was on intermittent when it came to the gym. I'd go sometimes, and sometimes I wouldn't go, and it just seemed that the sometimes I wouldn't go lasted more days than the some days that I would go. Right? But here's what I know about that. See, here's what I know about that. See, intermittent, it doesn't require, you know, the, the commitment, the dedication, the sacrifice, the perseverance that continuous does. See, when I don't feel like it, 
I've got to persevere. I've got to be dedicated. I've got to, it's not a lifestyle is what I'm saying. Working out was not a lifestyle. But for the last three years, it's been a lifestyle, and I've seen a tremendous difference from making it a lifestyle. Now, it's not this drag. Now, I'm looking forward to going and exercising and staying healthy each week because it's a part of what I do. I've set my commitment level to continuous. But intermittent is decep deceptive. It's like this. You know, we say that, you know what, uh, when we do that New Year's resolution and we, we set it to intermittent and we get it, you know, the not steady or continuous, we say, well, I tried dieting for a couple hours. <laughs> I tried going to the gym. Well, how often did you go? Well, I went a couple times last month. It just didn't work for me. Dieting just didn't work for me, right? Well, I tried small groups. I did that. Well, how often did you go? Well, I went to the first one. I just really wasn't digging it, right? I just, it just really didn't seem to be my vibe, my, my setting. It just really, we just didn't connect. Well, you gave it a pretty good shot, didn't you? What, were you there an hour? Did you get a chance to know anybody, right? Like, it, was, it, was it that way? We, but we do it. Come on, can I, can I, we do that with tithing. I, I tried tithing once, <laughs> right? I tried going to church a couple times. And just nothing changed, Nothing happened. I didn't get any checks in the mail, right? I didn't see all this wonderful stuff start because we set it to intermittent. Right, you with me this morning? Come on, if we're going to live a life of honor, if this is going to be who we are, right, we have to set our commitment level this morning to continuous because we don't want to be off and on. That's not the way that it is with Christianity. We don't just do good every once in a while. So we're going to get into this this morning, and I want to talk about this, how to live a life of honor in a messy world. It's a messy world. Trust me, it's messy out there. If you've not been out there, even when it's not raining, it's messy. So 1 Samuel chapter 18, I'm going to use two verses here. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 10 and 11. The very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul. And he began to rave in his house like a madman. It was messy in there. David was playing the harp as he did each day, continuous here. He's not on intermittent. But Saul had a spear in his hand, and he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped him twice. Not really the ideal situation. It's messy. Verse 17, same chapter. For Saul thought, I'll send him out against the Philistines concerning David. And let them kill him rather than doing it myself. Wow, sounds like a great leader that David's serving under. Sounds like the kind of guy that everybody wants to fill out an application and a resume and turn into this guy, right? Twice David escaped having a spear chucked at his head. Verse 20 and 21, it says, In the meantime, Saul's daughter, Michal, had fallen in love with David. Man, I just don't know that that's a good thing. And Saul was delighted when he heard about it. Here's another chance to see him killed by the Philistines. Not good, not good. Let's go to chapter 19 and see what else we see here. Saul now urged his servants and his son Jonathan to assassinate David. Verse 11. Then Saul sent troops to watch David's house. They were told to kill David when he came out the next morning. Do you guys get it this morning? Do you get that David lived in a messy world? If David was going to have a life of honor, he wasn't in the most ideal circumstances to show honor to his leadership. He was continuously, right, fearing for his life. Continuously, he had to think about, is the king of Israel going to kill me? So let's finish this right here. I'm going to look at chapter 26, verses 3 through 11. When David learned that Saul had come after him into the wilderness, now you've got to understand David is on the run. He fears for his life, and he has had to leave the palace, no longer serving in the king's house, palace. He's now running through the wilderness, seeking to escape the king. Now you need to understand how serious this is. Imagine the most powerful person getting the army together 
and seeking you. When the United States went after Osama bin Laden, they found this one person. Just the other day, there were all of these, these bombs that were these sent to people. Within a matter of hours, they had already found the individual who did this. Imagine if the United States military was after you. Imagine the fear. And they weren't just seeking to capture you. They're seeking to kill you. Do you think you could ever lay your head on the pillow at night and have peace? We're talking about anxiety blowing up the meter, right? This is serious. He sent out spies to verify the report of Saul's arrival. David slipped over to Saul's camp one night to look around. Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of his army, were sleeping inside a ring formed by slumbering warriors. Who will volunteer to go there with me? David asked Ahimelech the Hittite, and Abishai, son of Zariah, Joab's brother. I'll go with you, Abishai replied. So David and Abishai went right into Saul's camp and found him asleep with the spear stuck in the ground beside his head. Now Abner and the soldiers were lying asleep around him. God has surely handed over your enemy to us this time. That's the report. God has surely handed your enemy over to us, Abishai whispered to David. What an opportunity that you have. This is your opportunity to strike. And Abishai says, let me just pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear and I won't need to strike twice. I mean, in most cases, if you were on the intermittent level of commitment, you'd have said, do it, do it now. It'll all be over. We won't have to deal with this anymore. We won't deal with a crazy leader trying to kill me. But what was David's response? Surely this strikes us as strange because of the world that we live in. No, he said, no. David said, no, don't kill him. For who could remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? Hold on a second. The Lord's anointed one. The Lord has anointed Saul. He's trying to kill me. He throws spears at my head. He wants people to assassinate me. That's the Lord's anointed one? What kind of a leader is this? God anointed this man. God's lost his mind. Come on, right? Surely you thought this when you read this. No, David said, don't kill him. For who could remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? Surely the Lord will strike Saul down someday. Or he will die of old age or in battle. The Lord forbid that I should kill the one he has anointed. This is an absolutely outstanding passage of Scripture that's almost baffling, mind-boggling to try to grasp what is taking place here. Because it can mess with your theology when David used the terminology, the Lord's anointed. Because when we think in terms of the Lord's anointed, we think of this great leader that's perfect, he does everything right, he wants to honor and please God. How could anyone as crazy and psychotic as Saul be considered the Lord's anointed? See, it messes with our theology a little bit. How to live a life of honor in a messy world. I want you to catch this this morning. First, you accept that it's messy and you determine not to make it any messier. David's world was messy, but he chose not to make it any messier. Come on, are you with me this morning? Let me say it again. We accept that this world is messy and we determine not to make it any messier. You see, when I respond, listen, when I respond in like manner, I become like the very thing that I despise. When you repay evil for evil or when you just, you just need to let them have a piece of your mind, you just, you, you have to say it. Come on, when, when you, you just can't forgive and move on, you've got to go confront this and you've got to put them in their place, right? See, when I respond in like manner, I become like the very thing that I despise. And I'm going to tell you, God just used a situation to show me what was always in my heart. It just took the right situation to reveal it. 
Now, I know we don't like that, but you're gonna, if you've been around here long enough, you know my style of preaching is get to, the, get to the main thing. You know what I'm saying? Where the rubber meets the road, we gotta get to the heart. And I'm gonna show you why that's so important. See, listen, I can set the problem, or I can set the standard, or I can join the problem. I can set the standard. I'll refuse to gossip. I'll refuse to backbite. I'll refuse to respond and do. I'm going to leave it in the Lord's hand. But I can, I can do that. I can refuse or I can be a part of it. We could say it like this. We can be a part of the problem or we can be a part of the solution. Right? If God has placed us in the world that we live in to be the salt and the light how am I the salt and the light if I become like the very things, people, right, that Jesus had to die to set free? Why do you think he said things like, you know, if, if they ask for your, your, your shirt, give them your coat. If they ask you to walk your, the horse a mile, just go ahead and walk it too. Why do you think he's, he said, when you do these things, you're like your father in heaven. Love your enemy. Do good to those that hate you and do evil things to you, Right? That's countercultural. That's kingdom minded. Saying, no, I will not run a spear through his head, even though he's been chucking them at me, is countercultural. I guarantee you, Abishai was standing there like, this dude's an idiot. He's lost his mind. Come on, you know, because he thought he had the moment. First of all, he was brave enough and bold enough to go with David into the camp, and now they're there, and they've got Saul. They're there, they've got it. And he's like, what in the world? What in the world? Listen, we can perpetuate evil or you can break the curse. Catch that. You can perpetuate evil or you can break that curse. You see, evil started in the garden with Adam and Eve, right? It started when they disobeyed. But it was broke. The curse was broke. The curse started in the garden. Who did God curse? He cursed the ground. He cursed Satan. He was just on a cursing streak. Right? You, you know what I'm saying. Like, not cussing. <laughs> he was cursing. Right? He cursed the woman. She's going to have all this pain and childbearing, right? The, the relationship between man and woman, it ain't going to be like it should have been. Right? The woman's going to want to rule over the man and all this other bad stuff. Man's going to have to work by the sweat of his brow. The, the ground's going to produce thorns and thistles. All this, Right? It was cursed. But on the cross. See, on the cross, the curse was broken. So when we catch this, catch this, you don't want to miss this. When we respond like Jesus responded, we are living as the one who went up on that cross voluntarily and broke the curse that's in our life. Right? You with me there? I think it like this. I think it's more honorable to honor than dishonor. Whether you deserve it or not, it's more, I think it's more honorable to give somebody honor than dishonor. I'd rather be guilty of showing honor than dishonor. I'd rather be guilty of loving those that hate or seem to be completely unlovable. That's what I'd rather have because that starts to speak to my heart. right? I'd rather give grace to the undeserving, mercy to the ruthless. right? That's what I'd rather do because that's what Jesus did. Come on, that's what Jesus did. Now, that's not easy, loving those that aren't very lovable, giving grace to those that aren't deserving. But then again, was I deserving when he gave me grace? And that's what Colossians said. Remember, he said, you know, forgive one another, but remember, your Father in heaven forgave you. Come on, I want to be the one known for showing kindness to those that are cold-hearted and mean. When you would really have all the justification to just stand up and give them the what for, the how to it all, that give them a piece of your mind and just really, you have them. Nope. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to run the spear through you today, Saul. Come on, life of David right here. A life of honor. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 22 says this, If your enemies are hungry, give them food to eat. If they are thirsty, give them water to drink. You will heap burning coals of shame on their heads, and the Lord will what? Hold on a second here. The Lord will reward you for this? 
Is that not what we've been preaching for the last three weeks? The Lord will reward when you show honor. The Lord will reward when you do these things. You cut yourself off from the blessing and the rewards that God has for you when you refuse to do these things. Because when you do do them, you are modeling the Christ who is the image of the invisible God. The one that you say, I'm a Christian, right? When you do these things, God said he's going to reward this. Listen, I'm more concerned about what dishonor does to my heart than showing honor to someone that doesn't deserve it. I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about what's going to creep into this. And the truth is, what leader, what husband or wife or what coworker, what, what friend, what, what person is really perfect? Right? You, what leader have you ever served other that never did anything that ever offended you? What boss has ever just never done anything that aggravated you? Right? Every friend that you've ever had has done something that irritated you at some point or another, and we've done something to irritate others. None of us are perfect. So when you really break it down, I mean, if we're honest, when we really break it down, there's always something that's dishonorable about us that could disqualify us for showing honor. There's always something to criticize against the greatest of people. But again, I'm concerned about what happens to my heart because here's what I believe. I believe that honor originates in our heart. It starts here. I believe that it's a matter of the heart. And I believe that God it wants to get to our heart. Because think about it. What really doesn't start in the heart? What really doesn't start right there? In the deepest part of who we are, what doesn't start right there? Jesus was always preaching at the heart. His teachings were always aimed. They were directed. Specifically, he had a bullseye on your heart. He wasn't so much interested in all the formal talk and the religious, pious, whatever you acted like. He wanted to know where your heart was on the matter. Come on, right? He said things like this. Why do you worry about cleaning the outside of the glass when the inside is dirty? Right? Right? He says, why do you, you, you worry about straining the gnat, but then you swallow a what? Camel, right? He's like, you, you get so worried about all these things, but you don't focus on the inside. Jesus' teaching was always aimed right there because it's the central part of man. So we preach to hit the heart because I'm telling you, Satan's got a bullseye on your heart as well. Come on. If you don't know that, I'm telling you this morning, Satan is after your heart. Satan wants to get it. Proverbs 4.23 says like this, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life lifestyle your lifestyle will be determined by what gets into your heart right david said like this that our our eyes right he's going to guard his eyes and jesus said they're a window to our soul right what we set before our eyes and our ears they get in and they begin to junk it all up they trash it up because our ability to honor tells a tale of our heart and isaiah picked up on this and jesus quoted it in the new testament isaiah chapter 29 verse 13 says this then the lord said because this people Draw near with their words and honor me. Listen, honor me with lip service. Look, they know how to polish it all up. They're good at making the, 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 the icing, getting the icing on the, the mess on the inside, right? Be like going and getting a bunch of junk, nasty stuff and, and covering it up with a bunch of icing and, and making it look all pretty, right? He says, they honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me. And the reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. What's he saying there? They talk the talk. They know the words. They know what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. They can, they can make you think that they're so spiritual. They can make you think that they're so close to God. Because with their mouth, they're going to say all the right things, make it look all the right ways. But he said their hearts, their hearts are far from me. Because Jesus, he sees beyond the surface. Jesus always saw beyond the religiosity of his day. He always saw beyond the question. There was a motive that was behind the question. He didn't just hear the question. But he said, the reverence for me, listen, key words here. The reverence for me, it consists of tradition learned by rote. It's like this. They come into church every Sunday and they go through the motions. They know when to stand. They know when to sit. They know when to raise their hands. They know when to give a little bit here. They know when to do these things. It's, it's mechanical. 
It's just become a habit. There's nothing in here. It's not a, a, a flow, an outflow, the source that comes from within. It's just all external. Because I go home and I treat my wife like she's a no good for nothing piece of, you know, trash. Right? I verbally abuse her. Right? When I go to my workplace, I, I'm not the same person that I am when I come in the sanctuary. Right? Because it's not in my heart. True honor originates in the heart and it flows out of the fear of the Lord. And David feared the Lord. See, David feared the Lord. Listen, 1 Samuel 26, 9 says, David says, no, don't kill him. Fear of the Lord, right here. For who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? He feared God. He had reverence for God. Who could remain innocent? Who else would have known? It was just David and Abishai. There was nobody else around to go tell on him. It was a matter of David's heart. Surely the Lord will strike down Saul. He knew it was in God's hands. David's reverence for the Lord demonstrated by his choice to honor those who were not honorable. Saul had already walked away from God and lost the anointing, but David still, because he was in the position, chose to honor him. David's already been anointed to be the king. He knows this. The spirit has already left Saul, but he still occupied the position. And David saw the God that was behind the position. His honor superseded the man. Because the man was in the position that was established by God. Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject to the governing of the authority. For there is no authority except from God. Right? And all authority exists because God has established it. Those who reject this. Those who refuse to submit to this, subject themselves to it, they bring judgment upon themselves, the Bible says. God has established an order. But in this great test, hear me, in this great test for David, he revealed exactly why God chose him. Do you remember what God told Samuel? I have chosen a man who is what? After my heart. Come on, he is after my heart. Do you want to be a man or a woman this morning that's a man or a woman after God's own heart? Then you have to make this a lifestyle this morning. Here's what you've got to guard against. The pollution of complaining. The pollution of complaining. Because we fall into this. See, complaining, you know, we're expressing our dissatisfaction about something. How many of you are people watchers in here? People watchers? My wife catches me doing this all the time. Like, I literally am so obvious about it. Because of my facial expressions, I, I don't really hide things well that way. But I'm going to tell you a good place to people watch, the mall and airports. And I'll tell you what you catch when you watch people at the airports, the complaining. Come on, right? You go to the airport, you want to see some complaining. It's going to happen at the airport, right? It's the breeding ground for this. Why? Because flights get delayed. Right? They tell you your baggage is this or your baggage is that or they lose your baggage, right? The seats are too small, they're too narrow. Somebody in front of you has laid their seat back too far and then they, or you laid yours back and they're like, can you sit your seat up? They're complaining, right? Baby's crying on the airplane, you know, baggage fees, Wi-Fi doesn't work on the plane. I mean, you can, there's all kinds of stuff. I, I, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. I complain at the airport, right? But we got to ask ourselves this question. Why do some complain and others don't? Why do some have to just let it all out and others, they can keep it? How could David say no to killing Saul when others would have killed him? Right? Well, I think there's a threshold. You know what a threshold is, right? It's that place that right there before you go in or you go out, you know, you enter, you exit. It's kind of that mark, right? With that threshold for some of us, Right? We, 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 don't open the, or we don't keep the door closed when we need to keep it closed. Right? Our threshold is different because a lot of times we let things compound and then it continues to compound and then we just blow. Right? And there's something we're going to learn about David here in just a second that he did. Now, I know I had to, I actually, now, look, I, when I tell you that I preach these messages to me before I ever preach it to you, I actually had to call somebody last weekend not weekend I texted him and I had to apologize I had to ask for forgiveness and why because of this because of venting venting you know what venting is right I just needed to vent 
Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Event. You, you vented. You've called some people and vented. Just tell them that you're not what you're not happy about. Right? You just. But here's the deal. Research has said this. Research has said that after you have vented to whoever it is that you vent to, they actually feel worse and it has a negative effect on them just like it does you. Right? Research has proved this. So I had to text this person because God convicted me of venting and said, don't do that again. Even if you could trust and confide in them and you felt like what you needed to say, you needed to get it off your chest. God said, don't do that again. I'm not going to tell you who it is so you can't go ask them. Catch this, though. Catch this. We have been inculcated by this entitled nation to believe that it is our God-given right to complain and criticize. We live in a nation that has taught me, inculcated. They're teaching me this because I'm so entitled. I have a God-given right to complain and criticize. Our businesses, they have grievance policies. How you feel like yeah. Right? We, we, we think we need to share. We've got to do all this. Now, I'm not saying you can't ever, you know, talk about things that way. Come on, I'm not, like, taking that. But I think it's important that we catch this because this gets into our heart. It pollutes our heart. And I'm going to give you an example. In the book of Numbers, in the book of Numbers, chapter 12, there's a story there that's very important to our uh, topic today. Let me read just a few verses. While they were at Hazaroth, Miriam and Aram, they criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. I'm in debate here right now. So there's a lot of thoughts about what happened there. Obviously, he's marrying outside of his uh, race, the color of her skin. And I just saw a video that was flying around social media the other day where a pastor stood in the pulpit and literally went off on the congregation stating that if one of the white girls in the church married a black man, that he would never do it. He would have nothing to do with them. And, if, uh, uh, and, and vice versa, flip it back and forth. And I thought about this, and I thought, while they were in Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron, they criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. They said, has the Lord spoken only to Moses, through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? Right? So here we are, Moses' brother and sister. A lot of details here that get you, right? Because sometimes we, we talk differently to our family members. Sometimes we're just a little more candid. We just speak with a little bit of a different tone. And his brother and sister have approached him and they are criticizing his decision to marry this woman. And God heard him. Listen to what happens. Verse 8 says, I speak to Moses face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. So why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? And the Lord was very angry with them and he departed. He struck Miriam with leprosy. She was forced to leave the camp. God takes this kind of stuff very seriously. He takes it very seriously. Even when his own brothers and sisters, hear me this morning, even when Moses' brother and sister, his family members whom God spoke to, they were both prophets. God did speak to them. But when they started to criticize this particular position, this particular position, David recognized that I won't touch that. Don't you dare think you're going to leave. No, sir. I'll have nothing to do with it. We were just teaching our children yesterday. So at Evangel, when they go to school there, they're allowed to call in and tell Miss Carmen a Bible story. And then they can win a little prize in chapel. So they're always wanting to read the Bible, and they're always wanting to tell the story. But there's a story in the Old Testament, and maybe you're familiar with it, where Elisha the prophet is going along, and these kids are making fun of him. These people are making fun of the prophet. You know what they're saying? They're calling him baldy, baldy. And you know what happens? Bears come up out of the woods and eat and kill 32 of them. It's the craziest thing. But there's something about the position that God has established. And when you come against the position, God sees it as you come against me. And there's two verses that I'm telling you that just flip me out in the Bible. And that is that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. 
And God said this. He said, don't you repay evil. He said, I will repay. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And I'm telling you, that flips me out. It should flip you out too. I don't want God's vengeance. I don't want to fall into the hands of a living God. And I don't think David did either. Come on, I don't think David did either. And that's why he said, no, I'll let it God deal with this. Right? I'll let God deal with this. He's a whole lot bigger than me anyways. Look, my complaining and my criticizing, I'm just going to say this. It's an assault on the character of God because I can say I know better than you and I could do better. And if I was you in your place sitting on that throne, and I, I would do it this way. Even though I'm a created being with a finite mind, I tell the infinite who is omniscient how he should do his job. I believe it's an assault on the character of God because I bring him down to my level. Not only to my level, now he's below me because he doesn't know as much as me. If he would just consult me on the matter, I could, come on, you're with me, right? I could instruct God on how he should do what he does. You with me? We elevate ourselves. We know more. Listen to what Philippians says. Come on, stay with me on this. For this is gonna, it's going to get good, and we're just going to bring it to a close right here. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 says this. Just wanted to let you read it first so you could catch it, right? Do all things, all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless. Look, do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become. This is a part of your spiritual formation. This is a part of our development. That you may become blameless and harmless. Catch this. Do you realize you become guilty before God? You're not blameless and harmless when you do this stuff. I didn't write this. This is what I'm saying. That's why I had to text the person and say, forgive me for that. And they respond and say, well, you know, I, no, the Lord told me not to do this. Look, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I believe it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God if I ain't living that way. I'm walking the same road that you're walking, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God. We should distinguish ourselves by not complaining to disputing. Look, Children of God, without fault, in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Do you see the imagery here? You live in a messy world, a crooked and a perverse generation. Living a life of honor is one marked without this. While everyone else may come against the leadership, while everyone else may complain and criticize and do all these things, not us. Let it not be said of those who are children of God. The Apostle Paul couldn't have given it to us any clearer this morning. This is good when we tie it together this way. All right, I'm going to close with this. It's going to be a long conclusion, but I'm going to close right here. I'm going to tell you this. Let God handle your business. Let God handle your business. That's what David would let God handle his business. When he stood before Goliath, who do you think handled his business? God. I'm going to tell you right now. Who did he say that Goliath was coming against? The Lord's army. This is the, you're coming against God. How could he stand and be so confident? Because he knew the God was going to handle and fight for him. I'm telling you, this is good. He said, who could remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed? Now you're fighting against God instead of having God fight for you. This was, Goliath was God's problem. Saul was God's problem. Right? Not David's. David was just responsible for trusting God through the chaos and the messy world. When Jesus, the Son of God, the image of the invisible God, stood before Pontius Pilate, the Bible records in the book of Peter that he left his life in the hands of him who judges righteously. He could have spoke with one word and put Pilate in his place. The Bible records that when all of the soldiers came to arrest Jesus and they asked who it is that he is and he said, I am. And you know what the Bible records? They all fell down. 
Merely when he said, I am. They all fell down. Don't forget this is the one who was the architect at God's right hand. He was there in the beginning, the eternal one, the ancient one of days. He's the author of life. And when he speaks, he creates. He brings the dead back to life. This is Jesus. And he stood all power, all might. This is the one that fights for you. You don't have to fight for yourself. You don't have to defend yourself. And when you do, you tie God's hands. And in some cases, hear me, and in some cases, you don't just tie God's hands. You start fighting against God. Can I trust even when Goliath is there? Can I trust even when he's chucking spears at me? When I have the bad boss, the bad leader, can I trust? that God is still good. In, my, in one of my online courses this past week, we were in a discussion board, and one of the ladies in the course, she was writing on a topic that we had to discuss, and it was suffering. And she began by talking about how uh, earlier in the year she had lost a set of twins in a miscarriage. She talked about how she was angry with God. She talked about the battle that she went through. And she was writing to talk about how God revealed some things to her and was showing some things to her that she had not yet learned. God was using a situation that got to the deepest part. I'm not saying God caused the situation. There's a difference. We, 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 I think we quote it wrong when we say that you know, God does all these things. Well, I believe when the Bible says that all things work together for the good, I believe that God will take every situation in our messy world and use it for good. I don't believe that God willed all these things to happen. It was not his will that they send in the garden. It was not his will that these diseases would be in our world. It was not his will. That the, no, those are a result. But God has not promised to be above us, beneath us. God has promised to be with us and within us. And when we start learning to pray for God to bring us through instead of God to take us out, we will start to see that God has never left us nor has he forsaken us, right? And she learned that God was with her. The question is, can you still trust God and believe in God even if you have a miscarriage? If God doesn't heal, if God doesn't do this, if God doesn't answer it like you want it to happen, can you still trust? Even if you get a bad boss, can you still trust that God is in control? Even if Saul's chucking spears at your head, can you trust? Because it's all about God. See, this is all about God. Or is it? Let me, let me, let me, let me end it right here. It's either all about God or it isn't. Now, what I mean by that is this. Either I'm showing honor to God by honoring leaders, regardless, right, whether they're good or bad. Because I choose to honor God. See, David chose to honor God, and he could do and show honor even to a bad leader in Saul. See, honoring the dishonorable is because I do it for God. It revealed David's heart. John Bevere says this. He said, obedience really isn't even obedience until you disagree with your leader. He says it like this. He says, it's easy to do all the things that you agree with, but do something you don't agree with. See where you come to the crossroads. See where you come. Will you still do it? Keeping in mind that it's not something to cause me to sin because ultimately my authority is first in God. But if my leader asks me to do something that I don't agree with or like, that's when I'm really conflicted. And will I do it because it's the right thing to do? Right? It's the same way with my giving. It's the same way with my serving. Right, when I see my giving is unto God, I'll never say, I'm gonna, I'll start tithing again when you start doing it this way. I'll start to. You were never doing it for God in the first place. You were never doing it for God in the first place. And see, that's the show and tell. Show and tell. Are we, do we want to be the man or the woman after God's heart or do we not? Right? If I'm serving, look, if I come and I, I get a part of the community here and I serve, right? If, if I get involved and serve, and if some things start happening that I really don't like, then all of a sudden I stop. Right? And then you know what I do? Here's what I do. I go get on the sidelines, right? This is the sidelines. This is the bench in basketball, right? All my buddies are here on the bench, and the guys in the game are out there playing. They're the ones that are sweaty, 
Even when they're down by 20, they're still out there. But me and my buddies are over here because we don't like what coach is doing. And so you know what we're doing? We're complaining and criticizing. Right? He just don't know my talents. He just don't know my gifts. If he just put me in, if he just get the ball in my hands. Right? And so we get on the sidelines and we sit there and we complain and we criticize. Instead of really being in the game, right? Instead of being in it, but it was really never about those things. See, I'm not serving, I'm not doing because of any other thing because I want to please Jesus. That's what I want to do. So how do you do all this? I'm going to read a couple of psalms to you if, if the worship team could come to the platform. I want you to, to hear this. Because for David, it was always about God and it was never about anything else. And so instead of venting, this is what David did. Psalm 54. Come with great power, O God, and rescue me. Defend me with your might. Listen to my prayer, O God. Pay attention to my plea. For strangers are attacking me. Violent people are trying to kill me. They care nothing for God. But he writes, but God is my helper. The Lord keeps me alive. May the evil plans of my enemies be turned against them. Do as you have promised and put an end to them. I will sacrifice a voluntary offering to you. Not because everything else is good and not because I got a good priest like Eli, like we talked about last week. For you have rescued me from my troubles and helped me to triumph over my enemies. Psalm 55, it continues on. This is when Absalom's trying to usurp the throne and it's even crazy. He's running for his life. David chose not to fight his own son. He chose not to fight his own battle and he left the palace. The king, the king left the palace and he went out. He refused to fight. This is what he says. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my cry for help. Please listen and answer me, for I am overwhelmed by my troubles. My enemies shout at me, making loud and wicked threats. They bring trouble on me, and they angrily hunt me down. My heart pounds in my chest. The terror of death assaults me. Fear and trembling overwhelm me, and I can't stop shaking. This is serious for David. He says, oh, that I had wings like a dove, that I would fly away and rest. I would fly far away to the quiet of the wilderness. How quickly I would escape far from this wild storm of hatred. Yet he still chose not to fight back. Yet he still chose to leave it in God's hands. When the king of Israel, with all of the power, could have put an end to this very quickly. He says, confuse them, Lord, and frustrate their plans. For I see violence and conflict in the city. Its walls are patrolled day and night against the invaders. But the real danger, he says, is the wickedness within the city. Everything is falling apart. Threats and cheating are rampant in the streets. It is not an enemy who taunts me. I could bear that. It is not my foes who so arrogantly insult me. I could have hidden from them. Instead, it is you, my equal, my companion and close friend. What good fellowship we once enjoyed as we walked together to the house of God. David's talking about one of his confidants, one of those that was in his inner circle. I believe his name is something like this. I think it's a thith a thithopul. I can't spell that. But this person had left him and now sided with his son. You talk about the pain and the hurt. See, how do we live a life of honor in a messy world? I think you depend on Jesus. I think you do like the Apostle Paul said, Colossians 3, 2. You set your mind on things above and not on things of this earth. I think to keep our hearts pure in this messy world, you've got to stay on your knees before God. Now, I know that's not really in line with a lot of the contemporary preaching that you hear, but if you want to do this thing right, you've got to stay in connection. Can we stand this morning? I think and truly believe that we want to be a church of people that are known for honoring and not dishonoring. I believe you want to be a people that could be said about us, blameless and harmless, children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. I believe we want to be people that said, she has a heart after God. He, he has a heart after God. There's something different about him. There's something different. Come on, do you want that this morning? that this morning you know we sang a song king of my heart 
And I think we can seal the deal this morning. Maybe you're in here this morning and you need to invite Jesus into your life or you need to get it right again. You need to rededicate your life to Jesus. This is your moment. You can come up to the altar. You can kneel down at your chair right there and just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Help me start over and get this thing right. Maybe you've been in the place where it's been hard to honor some people. Maybe you do. You're under that Saul type of boss. Or maybe just others. Whatever it may be, whatever God's speaking to you about through this message this morning. Would you be willing to declare this song over your life, the king of my heart? Can we do that one? Can we do king of my heart? Is that possible? Yeah. Let's just sing that. And then we'll dismiss it.